We're going to continue with Chapter 6, Applications of Newton law, Newton's Laws. We're going to take the stuff that we learned in the previous chapters, put it all together, and now you're going to be able to analyze the forces in a, a problem, figure out what the net force is, use that to figure out what the acceleration is, and then figure out the trajectory of, of object um, from analyzing those forces. So here's an application of Newton's laws. Um, you have a piano and you're lifting up the piano with a, with a crane. How you draw your free body diagram is going to depend on what you consider the system. So for instance, if you consider the system to be the piano, you have to consider the forces of each of the strings on the piano itself. However, if you're, you consider the system to be the piano plus the strings, all that matters is the net tension on the crane, the, is the net tension pulling down on the crane and the net weight um, acting on the crane. So we're going to take these skills, we're going to analyze a lot of different problems. Here's an example of one that you can use the, your skills on. Um, you have a traffic light which is hanging from two ropes. Um, we're going to, I, I like working in variables until the very end, so we're going to call the, the angle of this rope theta we are going to call the angle of this rope phi. Um, this tension is tension, this string is tension one, this string has tension two, and then we have the weight. So we're gonna do the, so we've already got our picture, we've gotta draw our coordinate system so that we know um, how we're defining x and y. We're just gonna stick with the basic coordinate system with x along the horizontal and y along the vertical. Um, because there's no reason to use any other system. And now we're going to write down what each of our vectors is. So we will start by writing T1. Um, T1 is equal to the magnitude of T1. Uh, and then we're going to say cosine theta, and that is along the x hat direction, and it's negative. So we're going to put a negative sign here. And then we have plus T1 sine theta along the y direction. We have something very similar for T2, except now I have T2 instead of T1. I have cosine phi instead of cosine theta and sine phi instead of sine theta. Now in, for T2, my x and y components are both positive. Um, and then I have weight, and my weight is equal to negative um, m g in the y hat direction. Now I can add up all of these forces. So I'm going to add them up first along the x direction, and then I get t2 cosine phi x hat minus t1 cosine theta y hat. That has to equal zero because the traffic light is not moving. This is what we call an equilibrium problem when the net forces have to add up, e add up to zero. In the y direction, I have T1 sine theta plus T2 sine phi minus mg. And that all has to equal zero. From this equation, I can get an, uh, this should, I should not have my hats here. This was all the x components. I don't need, I had made a mistake that I complain about students doing. This is a scalar. It is the x component of the vector. It has to equal a scalar. That's how I caught my mistake. I just saw rogue x hats and y hats in them. So I'm gonna touch it up, I'm gonna fix that. I would recommend that you generally do your homework problems in pencil, it's easier to fix. All right, now we can solve this and say T2 over T1 equals cosine theta over cosine phi. It's going to seem sometimes like I'm doing real algebra really, really fast. You will get there. Feel free to slow this down if you need to follow the algebra steps. And you also have a pause button. All right, then we have Fy equals T1 sine theta plus t2 sine phi minus mg equals zero. So 
then depending on so depending on um, what the question asks, I may or may not need to. I can do different things with this. Often you're asked to I, to find to solve for all of the forces in the problem. So in this case, mg is easy. You would have to actually be given the mass of the traffic light, um, but that's fairly straightforward. But you might be asked to solve for the tension and, of both strings. Um, as a general rule, when you can solve for, you need n equations to solve for n unknowns. So here we have two equations. We have the x component and the y component. So we can solve for our two unknowns, the tension in each of the strings. So here I'm going to take this equation and plug this in for uh, t, use this to eliminate t2 um, so that I can solve for t1. So then I get t1 sine theta plus T1 tan phi cosine theta minus mg equals zero. So then I can solve this and get T1 equals <coughs> mg over sine theta plus tan phi cosine theta. And then I can use that to get T2 because T2 then equals, uh, this can be a little bit messy, uh, mg cosine theta cosine phi sine theta plus sine phi cosine theta. And then I would have to actually plug in the actual angles for, uh, for theta and phi to get, the, to get the final answer. Using, doing it this way, I can do a number of cross checks before I actually plug the numbers in. So here you can see I have mg times a bunch of numbers which are unitless. So I can tell that I have the right units. So a force should have the units of newtons or the same units as mg. Um, and I can tell I have the right answer because I, well, I can, I at least can tell that my answer could be the right answer because I have the right units. If you plug numbers in too soon, you're going to start, uh, it's too easy to miss that you made a mistake and your units will not work out. If most algebra mistakes, fortunately, most algebra mistakes would lead to you have the, having the wrong units. So if you keep everything as variables until the very end, you're going to catch most of your mistakes just by looking to see if the units make any sense. Okay, here you have two tugboats pushing a barge. And then you want to figure out what the acceleration of the barge is. Um, actually, this tells you what the acceleration of the barge is. I think this, so this would be an example, not an actual problem, but we'll treat it as you're given the forces, figure out what the, um, ah, so you could figure out the, well, you can't figure out the angle. The angle is set by the two forces. We're going to use the x and y, the, the coordinate system, which is here. Um, your free body diagram um, ah, has drag, uh, which is in the opposite direction of motion. It acts like friction. You have uh, the force from one, the first tugboat and the force from the second tugboat. So, um, and you have to know the angle of the, well, you know that the, so we can write each of the forces. So force, ah, yeah, force one is going to be the magnitude of force one, x hat. Force two is equal to the magnitude of force two, y hat. Uh, and then if you had, um, 
we will assume you were not given this at total acceleration. So then uh, your force of your force from drag is going to be at the same angle. Um, we'll, su we'll assume you start out with no accelerate with no motion. So your drag is always going to exactly oppose your motion. And um, you have force drag. Eh, we'll use the eh, we'll use the fifty three degrees instead. So you have the force dra of drag. That's going to give you this angle is fifty three point one degrees. We're going to call that theta. So your force of drag is going to be F D. Um, And then cosine theta x hat, this is going to act in the negative direction. And then it's also going to act in the negative direction in the y, in y. So f negative fd sine theta y hat. And you can add up the total forces. And this one looks like it's running out. Uh, and you would have Fx equals F1 minus Fd cosine theta. Fy equals F2 minus Fd sine theta. Um, and then you get the total force that, uh, the total force acting on the tugboat. And then if you have the total force acting on the tugboat and the mass of the tugboat, you can calculate the acceleration of the tugboat. Okay, here you have an elevator. This is a very important problem because um, obviously what you, so when you're on the elevator, you're actually going to perceive the forces that are applied to you and you don't necessarily, and that's different from the, for instance, the gravitational force that you actually experience. All right, so when you are in an elevator standing on a scale, if the elevator is stationary, <coughs> is stationary or moving at, uh, at, a constant, um, at a constant speed, then it's easy because if you're, so if it's stationary or moving at a constant speed, then you have the normal force acting on the person. I'm going to use a subscript of a person. Um, and then you have the weight of the person. And if you're just standing there and you're moving at a constant, um, at a constant speed, then your net force is zero. So your, the normal force is equal to the weight of the person. Then you move to the free body diagram for the scale. The scale experiences um, its own weight, and it uh, experiences a normal force from the elevator. It also experiences um, the normal force on the person in the opposite direction. So the, the person is pushing so the scale is pushing on the person, so the person is pushing on the scale. So then, and I haven't drawn this to scale. So now, the, the normal force of the elevator on the scale is equal to the, to the weight of the scale plus the weight of the person. What the scale will actually read is the normal force that the scale is applying to the person. All right, now if you are accelerating, if you are accelerating upwards, then um, if you write, we're going to use our coordinate system is going to use y up. So this is x and y. So 
if you are accelerating, you have normal force equals whatever the magnitude of the normal force is times y hat. The weight is equal to the mass of the person times g, and it's in a negative y hat. And your net force is equal to the normal force minus m g should be a y hat y hat and now we're going to say you're accelerating upwards so equals some acceleration now your normal force instead of equaling m g is going to equal the it's going to equal m g plus uh, sorry i dropped an m your total force is from the mass times the acceleration it's going to equal mg plus ma so that means that the scale instead of reading mg um, for the person is going to read mg plus a so your scale is actually going to read something different and this is actually, you can feel this. When you stand in an, ex an elevator and it's accelerating upward, what you feel, what you perceive as your gravity is not actually the um, real force of gravity. You, you're feeling your acceleration. So you feel mg plus a. You feel like you're he heavier when you're moving in an elevator going up. Now, I can switch the sign of the acceleration, an elevator going down, you're going to experience a lower weight. Um, you will, in fact, uh, if you are, if the elevator is dropped, your acceleration is equal to negative g, and you will experience no normal force. You are in free fall. You feel like you are weightless in that case. This is an important example because when you move on to, um, for instance, studying relativity, um, the first thing that you start with is an assumption that physics is the same in all coordinate systems. And this elevator problem is really important for understanding different coordinate, prop coordinate systems because when you're in the elevator, you're not, you, know, it, you are not aware of the world outside the elevator, only what you feel. Okay, here is another example. Um, we are given the coordinate system, so we don't have to draw it. We're given the sketch. We don't have to draw it. Um, you, have a, you have two coupled blocks. Um, we're going to neglect friction. We use tension only to redirect the force. Um, and now we're going to start, uh, we're going to write our, um, we're going to add up our net forces first on mass one. The force on mass one. Uh, the net force, because the weight and the normal force cancel out, the um, net, well, let me just go ahead and write it just to be totally pedantic. So, so, you know, when I'm teaching, I should be pedantic. The normal force is equal to the magnitude of the normal force, y hat. The So gravity, the weight is equal to the magnitude of the weight y hat and the, then you have the force the tension is equal to the magnitude of the tension x hat so your net force the net force in the y direction has to cancel out so f y equals zero equals oh there should be a negative sign there equals the normal force on block one minus the weight on block one. So the normal force is equal to the weight. Uh, and then Fy is equal to the tension, the magnitude of the tension is going to equal some the same thing for block one and block two. So we're just going to call it P. And then this is 
So the magnitude of the tension is then equal to mass 1 times acceleration 1. This should be x. All right, now we're going to do the same analysis for block 2. Mass 2. We have the weight 2 equals the magnitude of weight 2 in the negative y hat direction. Tension equals the magnitude of the tension in the positive y hat direction. Those are the only forces acting on the block. We can add them up, and the net force, well, actually, the net force in the x direction is easy because it's zero. There are no forces that act in the x direction. The net force in the y direction is equal to the tension minus the weight. And then this is equal to m2a2. The magnitude of a2 and A1 are equal. The directions of the accelerations are different, but the magnitudes are equal. So I can, the first thing that I'm going to do is write this as A, the acceleration, equals A1 equals tension over mass 1. Here, I'm going to write A2 equals A equals T over M2 minus, this is M2G, and I'm dividing by M2, so minus G. I can plug this in here. Tension equals tension over m2 minus g equals tension over m1. Now, I can put both tensions on the same side. Tension over m2 minus tension over m1 equals g. So, what does the tension equal? This is equal to T times 1 over M2 minus 1 over M1. This is equal to the tension times M1 minus M2 over M1 times M2. And this is not quite the reduced mass that we mentioned in the last, uh, the last lecture, but it's kind of close. You can see that this has units overall of 1 over mass, um, which makes sense. So this is units of acceleration. Um, force divided by mass, the, the units of force divided by the units of mass equal acceleration. So I can solve this and get that the tension is equal to m1 m2 over m1 minus m2 times g. So if m2 is larger than m1, then the tension flips directions. That doesn't make sense because that would mean that the, the rope, instead of acting in this direction, the, the tension instead of acting in this direction pushes the mass 2 down. So that's where this breaks down. We did use an inherent assumption here that the acceleration can only be down. It's possible that the acceleration is zero, but you're never going to get the acceleration in this system to, in, to move mass 2 up. Um, so that's where the, the problem breaks down because we in, assumed that the masses were falling. So um, if you, uh, so if mass one, so you can figure out here now what the directions of the, ten, what the magnitudes of the tensions are. I think I, yeah. So 
you take your set of rules from before, you take the same proce the procedure that we practiced in the last chapter, and you can start plugging through and using your skills now to um, figure out what the net forces on different objects are so that you can figure out where they're moving. All right, here, um, this is something called an Atwood machine. I had been uh, doing physics for a very long time when I finally Googled and figured out what an Atwood machine is. It exists only to teach people physics. Um, it doesn't have an independent purpose. So here, the, uh, the string is only redirecting the force, so you can draw your free body diagrams for mass one and mass two. Um, we can go through and write out what the equations are. So for mass one, you have the tension. We're going to draw the standard coordinate system x and y. It will seem a little bit obvious, but it's a good practice to be in because it's not always going to be the same. And with a large class, the chances are that someone will do something different. So it's always good to be very explicit. So for mass 1, the tension is equal to the mag magnitude of the tension, y hat. The weight is equal to negative m1g y hat. That is all you have. So T, so the net force, which is all in the y direction, is equal to T minus m1g, which is equal to m1 a1. For mass 2, you have almost the exact same problem. The tensions and the weights are the same, um, except now this is mass 2 instead of mass 1. Your net force in the y direction is equal to the tension minus m2 G, which is equal to M1, or sorry, M2A2. Now, the acceleration of mass 1 is equal to the negative of the acceleration of mass 2. And that constraint is because the two blocks are coupled to each other. So, using this, we can... Uh, plug this into A2, we can eliminate A2. So we get T minus M2G equals negative M2A1. Or I can write A1 equals T over M equals negative T over M2 Uh, my unknowns are the acceleration and the tension, and I can solve for both. So A1 equals negative T over M2 plus G. And this has to be equal to T over M1 plus G. So... This is not a use. All right, so we're going to actually solve this slightly differently. That was a dead end. I have this equation. Uh, and I have this equation. And I can add them. So I'm going to call this A and this B. A plus B. Actually, I'm sorry, I'm going to take the difference. A minus B, because then my tensions cancel out. So I get A minus B equals, so that's this side, and then here, M1A1 plus M2 
A1 equals M1 plus M2 A1. My tensions cancel out and here I have M2 minus M1 times G equals M1 plus M2 A1, or A1 equals M1 plus M2 over M2 minus M1, all times G. So A1 is positive if M2 is greater than M1 because then A1 is accelerating upwards. It is negative if M1 is accelerate if, if M1 is greater than M2, then it is accelerating downwards. And I can write A2 is the negative of this. So I switch my M's and M, my M1's and M2's in the equation. That also makes sense because this problem, the way this picture is drawn, if I just switch the indices of 1 and 2, I should get the same answer. There, the labeling was totally arbitrary. All right, now I want to figure out what my tension in the string is. So I am going to take equation A and rearrange it. The tension is equal to M1A1 plus m one G. I now have M1. This is equal to M1 plus M2 over M2 minus M1 all times G times M, so all times M1G plus M1G. So this is equal to M1 plus M2 over M2 minus M1, all plus 1 times M1G. M1 plus M2 plus M2 minus M1 over M2 minus M1. What I'm looking for here is an expression where if I swap my ones and twos, it doesn't matter. Or it will differ by at most a sign. All right, so now my M1s cancel out here, and I am left with 2 M2 two M1 G over M2 minus M1. All right, this makes sense. If I switch M1 and M2, the sign changes, but the mass does not. So the sign changing means the direction of the tension will change. When I wrote these equations out, I meant I, I, uh, there is an inherent assumption about the, these directions. So th this has this symmetric ex effect that you switch one and two and you get the, you get the same answer up to a sign. All right. So that's an Atwood machine, and it really is just a, t a tool for teaching physics and showing that when you can approximate the string and the pulley as being massless and frictionless, then uh, all the string is doing is redirecting the tension. You can come up with all sorts of complicated um, machines made out of systems of pulleys, now you have the tools that you can analyze each of them step by step and figure out what they, um, 
what the net force is on the mar. All right, here you have a tractor, which is pulling a couple of carts. Um, and you have some force from the engine, F tractor. The tractor itself has a weight and a normal force. And, uh, and then there's some tension in this string um, from pulling these carts. And then you could, you could draw chains of reactions um, to, to indicate what the, um, the tension uh, in the string, in, in, the, um, in the chain here, and you've got another tension in the chain here. So you, if you wanted to figure out the net um, acceleration of the tractor, you would have the, you could isolate the free body diagram and consider only the forces on the tractor. All right, now we're gonna talk about friction and drag. We've already done some problems that used friction and drag, but we haven't talked extensively about how they work. Friction conceptually um, is, it, coming from microscopic interactions between the surfaces of two different materials. So if you have a box sliding along the floor, what's really happening at the microscopic level is that you that box is not perfectly smooth and bumps and wiggles in the, the rough edges of the box are going to rub against the rough edges of the, um, of the floor. The rougher each of them are, the more they're going to stick to each other. So the more you're going to have to provide a little bit more force to get them to move along each other. Um, and that, so that's what's going on in friction. It is always counteracting, counteracting motion. So you can draw your free body diagram, but it's good to keep in mind that whatever you've drawn, you're making some assumption about the directions of the forces. And that's not necessarily totally true. Um, it, if you have something change in the problem, you have to consider that the direction of the force might switch. This came up when we considered the block sliding down the inclined plane. Um, if the block is sliding up the plane, friction is acting down the plane. If the block is sliding down the plane, friction is acting up the plane. And here, if you've got a box being pulled along the floor, the direction of friction is going to depend on which way you're, you're moving. It's always exactly the opposite to the direction of motion. Drag is going to act somewhat similar. So here um, you can see this is the force of friction as you move the, the box. So when you have static friction, static friction is, the, is friction, which is when, when the two objects are not moving relative to each other. So you've got, there's some force between them. The static force of static friction is keeping them from moving against each other. So when you are pushing against this block, that's basically saying you have to push hard enough to get it to move. So if you plot the force of friction as a function of, um, so here you are pl plotting the force of friction as a function of the force applied. You have to keep applying a strong enough force. The friction is always going to, it, it, when it's not moving, friction exactly um, counteracts the force that is a, that you're applying. At some point, you push enough that it starts moving, and then your connect your force of friction actually goes down. So this is the con the static friction regime, and this is the kinetic friction regime. And static friction can you're given the max when you're given mu sub s. That's the highest value that friction can can reach. It can always be lower. Um, kinetic friction is a, your own, by definition, you only have kinetic friction when you are moving, your object is moving relative to the surface. So you, whenever you have kinetic friction, you have a constant mu sub k, um, whereas static friction is giving you the highest amount allowed. And if you exceed that amount of friction, then you're going to get slipping. So this is another, uh, so in general, friction is larger when you have a smaller contact area, and it is larger when you have a larger contact area. Um, so, And the normal force, when you have a larger normal force, you have a greater contact area because you're really squishing those things into each other. And this actually can be used. You have, you have an atomic force microscope where you actually push the... It, 
it's a it has a probe that is on the order of a few atoms and you're actually pushing the probe down onto the surface and as you drag it across the surface you measure the um, you're measuring the force on the probe so you can actually measure the friction all right now we're going to move to examples um, for this chapter now you have a crate on a horizontal surface and you're going to push with a force against the crate. Um, and you can either have um, static or, um, or kinetic friction. So when we, um, we have, we're modeling the pushing force, the force for pushing here is just something constant along the x-axis. Note here that the axis is indicated. So I, uh, so I can start <coughs> writing down my equation. Um, I'm going to sketch the free body diagram here just to make it a little bit clearer. Here I've got weight. I'm going to put it all at one point. Um, weight, normal force. This marker is dead. We're going to swap markers. Weight. Normal force, friction, pushing. Weight equals magnitude of weight, y direction, negative. Normal force is equal to magnitude of the normal force, positive y hat. Uh, the force from pushing is equal to its magnitude x hat, and friction is equal to, we'll leave it as mu, and not specify kinetic or, um, or static yet, times the normal force. Add everything, and it's always negative x hat. Add everything up together, and you get a net y component of n minus w, which is equal to zero. So the normal force is equal to the weight. And that lets you plug this in, the normal force in here. And then you get that the force in the x direction is the force from pushing minus mu w. So the coefficient of friction times the weight. And that is going to equal to, or going to be equal to the mass times the acceleration. So here, um, if we have static, um, the case of static friction, the maximum pushing force that we can get, we can solve by setting the um, net force in the x direction equal to zero. And we would have to push, um, the, the highest amount we could push would be mu times the weight. Mu is typically on the order of 0.1, well, uh, 0.1 is a typical mu. You could get smaller, you could get greater, depending on what the material is. So if you have a 100 kilogram box, you would, if mu is 10, is 0.1, you would have to push with 10, 10 kilograms of force to get it moving. Okay, this is different from the case of kinetic friction. When you have kinetic friction, you are by definition moving. Um, although you don't have to have an, you could still have an acceleration of zero if you were moving at a constant speed. So if you have kinetic friction, then you don't know what your uh, you don't know what your acceleration in the x direction is, but you do know what your um, what your friction is. <coughs> so in that case, P minus mu weight, and this has to be mu sub k. This here is mu sub s equals m 
a, so then you can solve for your acceleration. So once you know, uh, so once you, you have to carefully analyze the diagram, make sure you get the direction of friction correct. And then your problem solving strategy is the same as what you've done for all of the other problems that you are just going to start writing down your equations, break everything into components, add it all up. Okay. Skier, skiing down an inclined slope. Um, we've done this before. We're going to do it again. We are going to use, ah, we're going to use the coordinate system that is drawn here on the problem. And then we, because we have the, the sketch drawn, we have the courses drawn, we can proceed with writing everything down. The normal force is equal to the magnitude of the normal force y hat. Weight is equal to weight. I'm going to call this theta because I like keeping everything as variables. So we have weight, negative weight, cosine theta, y hat, plus weight, sine theta, x hat. All right, so now I'm going to do as my sanity check. I want, when the angle is zero, all of the direction, all of the weight should be in the y direction. So when, when my inclined plane is not actually inclined, I should get back to gravity as I had it before. So here, if I plug in theta equals zero, my, um, my weight is entirely in the um, negative y direction. Good. I like when that happens. All right. Now I have, uh, I have to have friction. Friction is going to equal mu, and then this is kinetic because we're moving, mu k times the normal force in the, we are, ah, here, my weight was actually also acting in the negative x direction. I am going down the ramp, so this is going to be in the positive x hat direction. I can add up all of the forces. And I get in the y direction n equals, sorry, n minus w cosine theta equals zero, or the normal force is equal to w cosine theta. Plug that back in up here, mu sub k, w cosine theta x hat. Net force in the x direction is then mu sub k w cosine theta minus w sine theta. Or I can write this, so this is equal to m a. I'm going to replace my w's by m g. Now, if I'm solving for my acceleration, I get that my acceleration is equal to mu sub k g cosine theta minus g sine theta. And if I switch my coordinate system so that instead of x being positive up the hill, x is positive down the hill, then this switch is sine. If instead of going down the hill, I'm going up the hill, this term only switches sine. If we think about, so a few cross checks note here, so mu, the, the coefficient of friction is always unitless, and cosines and sines are unitless. So um, my units here are the same units as g, and that's good because I have to have units of acceleration here. If we think about what should happen, I should accelerate faster the steeper the slope is. Um, so sine increases with theta, cosine decreases. The steeper the slope, 
the more I'm accelerating due to gravity, and the less, because cosine gets decreases with increasing theta, the less friction I have. Um, and uh, so that, qual that passes the sniff test. It's a good thing to think about after you've solved your problem. You want to think about what that is telling you about the behavior of the, um, the behavior of your system. Okay, so now we're, we can have slightly, we can come up with an infinite number of complicated systems to analyze. Here you have two blocks sitting on top of each other, or one sitting on top of the other. Um, I think it's good practice to always have um, variables until the very end. We're going to call this A. We're going to call this B. This is B. This is A. Okay, so now when we consider A, we have, um, we have its weight. I can draw a simplified free body diagram. We have weight. The, so friction is acting. Here you're pulling on B. So a is moving, if at all, it's moving in that direction, so friction has to act in this direction. And then you have tension in the string, and then you have the normal force, and I want to be a little bit meticulous here. This is the normal force uh, of V on A. Now we move to the free body diagram for B. We have, so the block A is pushing down on block B, so block B is, so block B is pushing up on block A, so block A is pushing down on block B. So this is the normal force of block A on B. And then we have the normal force of uh, the floor on block B. That acts up. We have the tension in the string, which is pulling, which is in this direction. The string is pulling both blocks in the same direction. Then you have the force from pulling. You have the weight of, I'm going to put weight sub A. Here you have the weight sub B. And then you have friction, so this is going to be the friction of B on A. That friction is going to, it's acting, B is slowing A down, so it acts this way on A, but it acts that way on B because B is trying to go that way. So this is the friction of A on B. And then B is moving that way. So you also have friction of the floor on B. Now, if we want to write out what's going on in this system and figure out the net force, we have to do the net force on A, and we can write N of B on A is equal to the magnitude of B on A, Y hat, the weight, 
of A is equal to M A G negative Y hat. <coughs> Tension on A is equal to T X hat. And then friction of B on A is equal to mu between A and B times the magnitude of the normal force, and it is in the positive x hat direction. Now, we can write up all of our forces. The net force in the y direction is equal to n of b on a minus m a g, and that is equal to zero. Therefore, we can get n of b on a equals m a g. I can take that and plug it back in here and get mu sub a b m a g x hat. Now I add up the forces in my x direction and I get the tension. Let's see, this should have been in the negative x direction sign error there. So I get the tension minus mu sub a b m a g. And this is equal to m a a sub a. Sometimes physicists habits with using lots of subscripts leads us to some really you know, a sub a. It's a weird variable. I admit it, but I'm going to stick with it. I'm not backing out now. All right, we're going to do the same analysis for block B. I'm going to change colors to make sure that it is uh, that it is highlighted clearly. Okay, so now I can write n floor equals n floor y hat. P, I'm going to write as negative P X hat. T is positive T X hat. F, the friction A B is equal to I now know it has to have the same magnitude as this, so it's going, to, and it's also, it's acting in the positive x direction, so now it is mu a b m a g, and that's because this is equal in magnitude and opposite in direction to that. This is a reaction pair. Okay, so then I need F floor on B, and this is equal to N. It equals mu floor N floor. And I need, oh, here I need an x hat. Here I need an x hat. And I should have four in the x direction. I've got all four vectors in the x direction. N A B equals negative N B A. This we had to, so, this is equal to 
M A G and it is acting in the negative y hat direction. And then finally, the weight of B is negative M B G. Whew. I'm tired after writing all that down. Okay. Now we have to analyze this. We're going to start with the y directions. So f sub y, the y direction. Um, f sub y, the reason I'm starting here is because it's going to give me the normal force. And from the normal force, I can get friction. So I have n floor equal, or n floor minus m a g this is missing a y hat minus m b g equals zero this gives me what is not surprising but it's good to see that if we meticulously solve this following our procedure we get the, the answer we expect n floor equals M A plus M B G. So that's saying the normal force of the floor on B is equal to the, um, the weight of B plus the weight of A. Sort of makes sense. If you didn't have them moving at all, you, you could treat them as one system. Okay, now we look at the X direction and we get negative P plus T plus mu sub A, B, M, A, G plus mu sub floor, N sub floor, which is now M, A plus M, B times G, and all of that has to equal M B A sub A, oh sorry, A sub B. We have a constraint, the acceleration of A has to equal, be equal in magnitude and opposite in direction to the acceleration of B. So A sub A equals negative A sub B. All right, I am going to divide through. So here, I'm gonna divide through by B, or sorry, by M A. And I get A sub A equals tension over M sub A minus mu sub a b m a over m a times g. So this is my acceleration of a. I still have a tension in there. Actually, I'm going to solve it a slightly different way. Sorry about that. What I'm going to do is, do I want the acceleration? Do I want the tension? If I take, if I subtract this equation from this equation, my t tensions will cancel out. So I am going to subtract this. So I have a minus t and a plus mu sub a b m sub a g and a minus m a sub A, add them all together, my tensions cancel out, I have, I have these two terms that I can combine, and I can combine these, 
using the fact that these are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. So I get negative p, which I wanted to write as a b for some reason, negative p plus 2 mu sub a b m a g. So here the friction of a on b is coming in with twice the magnitude, which makes sense because it's slowing down both a and b. And then plus mu sub floor m a plus m b g equals m a plus m b times a b. So then my acceleration is equal to, I'm going to divide through by ma plus mb. I have an acceleration of negative p over ma plus, and I should put the b because the sign is opposite for the other one, ma over M plus mb plus 2 mu sub a b m a over m a plus m b g. Notice that g has units of acceleration. This is a unitless quantity. That's a unitless quantity. I have the right units. Plus mu sub floor g. So friction from the two masses rubbing against each other comes in twice because it acts on both of the blocks. And then the floor only comes in once. And it acts like it's accelerating both masses because it is. So here, our answer qualitatively makes sense. We can go back in and solve for tension in the string. I think I'm going to skip that. Um, you, would, you could plug this in and, uh, and use, I would actually flip the sign and plug it back in here because that's the simpler expression. But that's a few more lines of algebra. I think we've done enough with this problem, so we're going to um, stop this problem right here. All right, so now we're going to continue with a slightly different problem. This is another problem that I, I love to ask problems like this. You have a box in uh, sitting on the back of a truck, and the truck is accelerating forward. Draw a free body diagram for the crate. Remember, friction opposes the direction of motion. So, it, so it's always going to act in the opposite of the direction of the motion. Now, that crate is sitting on the truck. If the truck is accelerating forward, then if you were the box, it would feel like the truck is moving out from underneath you. It would feel like the truck is, uh, the truck is going this way from your perspective. So, the acceleration is going to go forward. It's going, and it's going to keep the the friction is going to keep the box moving forward. So, you you have three forces. You have weight, which we can write this as put a W there. That's the weight. Um, you have the normal force, and then you have friction. Now, we can start writing down each of our forces. So, oh, and yeah, we're going to stick with the coordinate system drawn on the figure there. Remember your steps, you're going to draw a sketch, draw your coordinate system, start drawing out, write down all of your forces on your free body diagram, and then start writing everything down in terms of its coordinates. So, we're going to make the normal force, that's the magnitude of the normal force, times y hat. Weight is the magnitude of weight times y hat, and now this is in the negative direction. And then, um, and in this case, we are actually given that the weight is 490 newtons. 
and then friction. Friction is going to be the coefficient of friction times the normal force in the positive x hat direction. Now, we could actually have two cases. We could have static friction, and then you're asking what is the maximum um, amount of friction to, that you can get, um, which would then answer the question, how quickly can the box accelerate um, in order to stay on the truck? Or you can have kinetic friction. If you have kinetic friction, the box is sliding off of the truck. So whether you've got kinetic friction or static friction has to do with whether or not the box is moving relative to the truck. It's, it's not whether or not the box is moving relative to an observer. So if you are over here watching what's going on, you, you, know, you see the, bo the box either moving along with the truck or slipping off the back. Um, but what matters for determining the direction of friction is what the box feels. Okay, now we can add up these, uh, add up these forces. Uh, and we're going to add up the y components. At this point, it may be obvious to you what the answer is, but you're, I want you to get in the habit of always meticulously drawing all of the, meticulously writing out all of the steps. So in the y direction, you have the normal force minus the weight, and this has to equal zero because the box is not going, not bouncing off of the truck and it is not falling through the truck. So that tells you that the normal force is equal to the magnitude, the magnitude of the normal force is equal to the magnitude of the weight. And then you can do the same thing in the x direction. And now we have that the acceleration is mu times the normal force, which is equal to mu times the weight. And that has to equal the um, mass of the box times its acceleration. Now, we also know that the weight is equal to mass times g. So we could, we can write that this is, um, that this is the weight over g times the acceleration. And then we can simplify this equation because we have a weight on both sides and then the acceleration is equal to let's see so did i skip too many steps i can write that the acceleration is equal to mu times G. And that's going to be, so that's the maximum acceleration. If, so if this is static, this is the maximum acceleration that you can have. Um, so that tells you that the, for the box to travel with the truck, um, because mu can always be smaller than the static mu, so the acceleration has to be less than or equal to the static coefficient of friction. If you accelerate any faster than that, then the box is going to slip off of the truck. Uh, if you have, well, if you have kinetic friction, then the box is going to, um, then the box is, the box's acceleration relative to the truck is only is going to um, only be mu sub kinetic g. The box is going to accelerate with the truck, but up to the maximum that uh, that friction will allow. I like to ask problems like this on the um, on the exam um, because. Often, what, what people do when they look at problems like this, they will say, oh, well, the box is staying on the truck. They're going to put the friction in the wrong direction because uh, 
they feel like the, buck, the, the truck is accelerating this way, so friction has to act that way to counteract it. No, friction in this case is what is actually making the box accelerate. And you know that because the only thing that is the only thing that the box is touching is the truck. There really can only be three forces on this box. You only have friction, the normal force, and weight. So you you'd have nothing else. There's no other way to apply a force. So therefore, friction has to be the thing getting the truck to accelerate. What what tricks people about this one is that the friction is opposing the truck moving relative to the box. So if you had no forces acting on the box, the truck would move right, un right out from underneath the box. So if you had a frictionless surface on the truck, the, the box is just gonna, the truck's gonna move out from under the box. The net acceleration of the box in the frame of an observer is zero. So to get any ex net acceleration, you have to have that friction keeping the truck, uh, keeping the box moving along relative to the truck. Okay, now notice how often this uh, something going down an inclined plane comes up. We're going to do this again. So I keep everything as a variable until the very end. This is theta. Uh, and here we do not have, uh, this says that the skier, the snowboarder is sliding down the slope. Um, and we can choose our coordinate system. Um, I am, I have always put X going up the slope. So this time I am going to put X going down the slope. X, Y. All right, and I'm doing that just to walk you through, just also to make sure that you don't get stuck in a certain frame where you're always solving, a, you're always setting coordinates up in a fixed way. All right, now we have, um, if we draw our free body diagram, we have normal, or we have weight, we have the normal force, and then we have friction. The snowboarder is sliding down the slope, so friction is going to act up the slope. And I've sort of kind of drawn these to scale. The normal force has to cancel out the weight. So, uh, so we know there's going to be no net force in the y direction. Now we're going to go through and write our forces. The normal force is equal to n y hat. Weight is equal to the magnitude of the weight. Uh, and I have to draw my angles. This is theta. So weight cosine theta is the y hat, the y hat direction. Um, and it's got to be negative because weight is pointing downwards. Now, in this case, so the magnitude of the x component is w sine theta. It has to be positive because I have pointed my x-axis in the positive direction. Now, this means if you are worried about the z-axis, we have to go z, uh, x-axis cross y-axis equals z-axis. It's going to be pointing towards u. Um, all right, then we need the force of friction. Friction is equal to mu times the magnitude of n, and this time it is in the negative x hat direction because we have put our um, positive x hat going down the slope. All right, then we can add these all up. We're going to first look at the uh, net force in the y direction. It is n minus w cosine theta, and it has to equal zero because there's no net because the skier snowboarder is not bouncing off the slope or falling through the slope. So we get that n is equal to w cosine theta. We look at the net force in the y direction, and then you get uh, 
you get, or sorry, in the x direction, we just did the y direction. And we have w sine theta minus mu times the normal force, which is w cosine theta. This is equal to ma, and we can write w is mg, so we have mg sine theta minus mu mg cosine theta equals ma. Now, I have an m everywhere. I can cancel out my m's. And I am left with an acceleration, which is sine theta minus mu cosine theta all times g. I grouped it like that because this is all a unitless quantity. And this has units of acceleration because g is, is it has units, g is meters per second, so has units of meters per second squared. So now I have a unitless quantity times something with the right uh, acceleration, or with the right units. So then you can also see the higher the slope, the larger this term becomes, the smaller this term becomes. So the higher the slope, the greater the acceleration, which is what you would expect. So hopefully this something going down an inclined plane is becoming second nature, and it's now incredibly obvious that you want to draw your coordinate systems not parallel to the ground, not with the x parallel to the ground, but with the x parallel to the slope. That will show up on the exam. You cannot pass my class without demonstrating that you can do that. All right, now a car is on level ground and turning to the left. The centripetal force causing the car to turn in a circle is the friction due to the tires, is the friction between the tires and the road. A minimum coefficient of friction is needed or the car will move in a larger, larger radius curve and leave the railway, the roadway. Sorry, my son is obsessed with trains, so I talk about trains a lot. Okay, so then you, the only place is, is you always have weight and you always have the normal force. Then the only place where you can have friction acting to, to make the car turn the only force external to the car where you can have um, a force acting is where the tire meets the road. So you have, you have friction between the tire and the road. Um, and this is trying to oppose the wheel slipping relative to the road. You know that the net acceleration of the car is, uh, is left. And I should mention here, when we do the videos, the, the mirror image is actually taken. So you're seeing the mirror image of what I am doing. Um, so the car turns left. Um, and then you have uh, this free body diagram. That's how the, that's how the cars, how cars turn. All right. Now, of course, what do you do? <laughs> what do you do in an intro physics class? You take something simple and you put it on an inclined plane. Now you have a car on a banked curve and it is, um, and we analyze the forces. So you have a car on an inclined plane. You in principle, um, so you have the normal force and you have weight. Now you actually don't need to have any friction because you have this component of normal force, or sorry, component of the weight, which cancels out the normal force. And then you get, I'm gonna actually draw my coordinate system so that you know, so that I can call things X and Y. So this is my coordinate system. And you have some component, you have a component of the weight 
in the X direction, you no longer need friction between the car and the road in order to make the car turn to the left. And this is why in racetracks they make the, they make the um, racetrack banked. And they'll even do this with, um, with for instance, interstates, so that it's easier for cars to, tr to stay on the road when they are turning. All right, and now I've, I've teased this a little bit. We're going to talk some about moving reference frames. What we do in intro physics is um, to rehash what was done in classical physics, but this is building up your understanding of classical physics so that you can later learn how it breaks down when you hit relativity. Okay, so now in a banked turn on an airplane, so the airplane is actually tilting, because the airplane is tilting, some component of the, a, there is a component of the weight which actually helps the airplane turn to the left. Um, and yet, if you're in the airplane, you don't, you, you perceive your, you don't, you perceive yourself as turning to the left, but you don't feel like, it, you know, if you're in the airplane, you're perceiving a, an acceleration in that direction that's entirely caused by, um, by the weight and not uh, an external, not, not some force um, applied to the airplane. All right, you're sitting in the car. If um, I am over here watching you sitting in a car as the car turns, what I see you, what I see is that you are accelerating with the car in this direction. If you are sitting in the car, you feel like you are accelerating in that direction because the car is actually moving out from underneath you and because and it's the car door and friction of you with the seat in the car that is keeping that is accelerating you with the car but you feel a force in this direction um, so because the force has to act on you in order to um, in order to keep you moving with the car so depending on which frame you're in whether you are stationary relative to the earth or whether you are stationary relative to the car moving relative to the earth you are going to um, perceive different things so um, this we call this the fact that you feel like there is a force uh, if you're if you're turning uh, if you're turning right you feel like there's a force on you to the left and vice versa um, that is called a fictitious force because it is not actually a real force. The reason why I'm very careful to articulate when we're talking about centripetal acceleration, centripetal acceleration is an acceleration which makes you move in a circle. Centrifugal acceleration is a fictitious force which you feel when you are in a moving coordinate system. So when you're in a car which moves, you feel like you are being pushed outward, but actually you are, your acceleration is inward. And that's why I'm always very meticulous. You almost never in this class are going to be talking about centrifugal force. You're all basically always talking about centripetal force. And here's another example. So when you are on a merry-go-round, alas, they don't have very many real merry-go-rounds at, at playgrounds anymore because they were uh, a little dangerous. Um, when you're on a merry-go-round, to go in the circle, your actual acceleration is towards the center of the circle. So however, um, you feel, so if, if an observer is watching, an observer sees you as having a, um, an acceleration pointing towards the circle, you feel as if you are being pushed outward. 
if you let go of the of the merry-go-round, so if this guy gets off the horse, you're you feel like you're being pushed outward and off the merry-go-round. What's really happening is that you no longer have a if you are not um, holding on tightly to the horse, you don't have enough um, force keeping you on the horse, which is acting on you towards the center, and the merry-go-round moves out from underneath you, not the opposite. So this is, so when you are thinking about the forces on you, when you're sitting on the merry-go-round, what you perceive is a centrifugal force, um, but what is act, the real force is the centripetal force. This is what we call an inertial frame of the, an inertial frame of reference, the frame of the Earth, because that is an, a frame of reference which is not accelerating. Um, the merry-go-round, when you are in the frame of the merry-go-round, the, um, the coordinate system, what you perceive, is accelerating. So this is when you will see these, you will feel these fictitious forces. And one of the key, um, one of Einstein's key hypotheses leading to relativity was that the um, laws of physics are, you're going to get the same, um, the same answer in inertial frames of reference. Um, you have to be careful when you're in non-inertial frames of reference because you can get these fictitious forces. And here I want to mention the Earth is actually technically a non-inertial frame of reference because the Earth is rotating around the sun and around its axis. So um, if you are considering, a number, if you need something to high precision, those effects start to matter. However, for most cases, we, consider, we can consider the Earth approximately uh, to be an inertial frame of reference because the acceleration um, relative, the acceleration of the coordinate system is usually in this class, the acceleration of the Earth relative to um, other forces in the problem is negligible. Okay, so when you have a centrifuge, these, these fictitious forces actually come in handy because uh, something in the frame of reference of the centrifuge is going to feel, um, is going to have an apparent force which por forces it outside. Just like when you are on, the merry on a merry-go-round, you feel like you are being pushed out. And this is just an, another, um, another image. So if you look at something that is, um, you put a ball on a merry-go-round and you just release it, if you're watching from the frame of the Earth, it is going to travel um, with a constant velocity um, it, it's sliding off the merry-go-round, but if you look at it relative to the merry-go-round, it's going to look like it is, um, it's going to look like it is um, curving. All right, and with that, we're going to end chapter six, and I'll see you guys for chapter seven.